All right. Hi, Tosca. How are you? Hi, Douglas. I'm great. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. You are a New York Times bestselling author. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> How many books have you written? Well, written or published because okay, published then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've published 11. And um, but I did, you know, I haven't I haven't published my very first novel and I doubt I ever will. And I've got some others that are in the hopper now. So but 11 are out right now. OK, I guess I got to ask the other question then. How many have you written? <laughs> um, so one, two, three others. Oh, three, three others. others. Okay, I thought you were going to say like 50 yeah. or something. No, no, yeah, it could be worse. <laughs> three <laughs> others. And one of those we're hoping to sell soon. It's already done and um, we just need to find a home for it. So. Okay, now is everything you write thrillers? Do you just stick with one genre or do you have multiple no. genres? Or? I write um, historical. So I've done um, ancient biblical historical. So I've written the story of Judas Iscariot. I've written about the Queen of Sheba. I've written about Eve as in Adam and Eve. And then I've done thrillers and some dystopian thrillers and then some slight paranormal uh, thrillers as well that lean a little bit young adult. So I'm a little bit all over the board, but and it drives my agent crazy. But, you know, I, I don't like to read only one kind of book and I don't like to eat only one kind of food. So I don't like to write only one kind of story. So, <laughs> Well, it makes sense to me, although I know with uh, you're with a traditional publisher not rather than self-published. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For now, that's not to say I won't self-publish because I really would like to do that at some point. Well, the one thing that I've spoke with many authors about and the, the basic fundamental difference is that if you self publish, you can be in 50 different genres and nobody cares. But if you right. go with a traditional publisher, they want to try to put you on a shelf. And yeah. if you're too much this way or that way, but not specific enough, they might have you edit it or, or cut it or redo it. So your freedom is greater if you self publish. You your know? freedom. Yes, it is. You're pretty much the master of your own destiny. In the traditional publishing world, of course, category is such a big part of the conversation. Category meaning the specific genre and how are they going to market that? How are they going to place it? How are they going to sell it to bookstores? So um, that is much more of a consideration. Do you have any idea what the breakdown is between people that actually purchase a physical copy of your book or they get an ebook is it more one way or the other you know i the last time i looked i thought it was pretty close to half and half um but i'm not sure i know that when one of my books comes out right away it generally comes out in hardcover and uh ebook and in general i do sell more hardcovers right at the start but um, then, you know, later the paperbacks come out. And, but I do feel like it's kind of pretty close to 50 50. OK, well, that's that's real interesting, because if mm -hmm. I try to make a comparison between that and say music, there is no comparison <laughs> right. Be because not anymore, not no. anymore. No, selling a CD is almost impossible, but everybody's just doing downloads. So yeah, exactly. I wonder why it didn't the digital revolution didn't kill physical books quite as badly as it did with music. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure because, you know, the, the whole book industry does kind of follow the where the music industry goes. So yeah. when music downloads went that way more than we started having ebooks and we started going that way. Um, I think it's nostalgia, actually. I think the the nostalgia of holding a physical book and also you know, there's some there's a different experience about reading a physical book, too. And if you want to go back and find something in a book and look where you were, sometimes I know people like me often remember it was on this side of the page or it was near the top of the page. And the orientation is completely different when you're reading a, a, an ebook. You know, I just thought of another reason, too. With a physical book, you don't need electricity. 
You don't need electricity. You don't need internet. I mean, you can be completely, talk about yeah. mobile, right? <laughs> I mean, you don't need any sort of apparatus to, to play it. All you need are your right. eyes and enough light yeah. to be able to read. You exactly. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of people like to, <laughs> yeah, a lot of people yeah. like to take a book to the beach, you know, mm -hmm. and read on the beach. And granted, you can take your phone and listen to music there, but you still, if your phone dies. Right. You know, so. Well, it's kind of hard on your eyes, too. If you've ever tried to read an ebook in the sun, oh, yeah. it's not it's, quite the same. So. Yeah. Even, yeah, to, to look at the phone when you're out on the beach or something is pretty impossible. You always have to put a towel yeah. over your head to try to- yeah, You need this, a towel or an phone. umbrella or something <laughs> or an umbrella. because the glare is too great. And it's, and it's at that point, you're just fatiguing your eyes <laughs> more than really enjoying yourself, so. Yeah, so give us a quick backstory of yourself. Have you been writing your whole life or did you do something else before you started oh. writing? Or? Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> Uh, about um, <laughs> seven, eight minutes, so yeah. oh, we're okay. Okay, well, um, you know, I didn't really set out to become an author. I set out to become a ballerina. That was my dream from a young age. I ballerina. danced in my yeah. professionally as a teenager. Um, and I also injured myself as a teenager, too. And um, I tore a muscle, and it was hard enough to come back from that that I knew I was losing valuable time. And so I, I thought, you know, this may not actually happen. Um, and I still love ballet. I've still done it up even until last year, until the pandemic hit. Um, but I went off to college thinking I'd probably have to do something else. And, you know, what happened is I, I came home. I went to school in Massachusetts and I was living in Nebraska. My family was here in Nebraska. And I came home for spring break to Nebraska. I'm like the one person who goes to Nebraska for spring break. <laughs> and I was talking with my dad about one of my favorite novels of all time, The Mists of Avalon, and uh, by Marion Zimmer Bradley. And I was talking about how a great novel is a lot like a roller coaster. And it's got twists and turns and about faces. And I just blurted out that day, you know, I think I'd like to try to write a book. And the idea was I would like to try to provide the same kind of roller coaster ride that I loved so much in reading uh, to somebody else and see if I could build that. And my dad said to me, okay, Toss, got, you know, I was supposed to work at the bank that summer uh, for my second summer and as a bank teller. My dad said, I will make you a deal. I will pay you what you would have made working at the bank this summer if you write your first novel, do it full time and treat it like a job. And that was intoxicating to me. And I said, yeah, absolutely. So I wrote my first novel that summer of 1989, actually. And I did try to get an agent and do all the traditional stuff the following summer after my next year of college. And I failed miserably. Um, and I deserved to because the novel wasn't that great. Um, but, you know, that's the only way to learn how to write a novel is to write a novel. So I, I kind of had the bug at that point, and I knew I wanted to try to do it again. I still had this dream of doing it, um, and I took a stab at another book over the course of the next, I want to say, nine years. And then all of a sudden had another idea that actually what, what became my first novel, Demon, a memoir. Um, and I wrote that around 1998, 99. I wrote it very quickly, and I thought that meant that it was meant to be. But no, it took six years for me to sell that novel, and I got rejected by everybody. Um, but I did finally sell it, and it came out in, I believe it's 2007. So my very first novel came out um, 14 years ago. Um, can you give us one example of what they said to you as a rejection? Just, just one of them, yeah. because I think it's good for people who are aspiring to write to understand that this business, and it's not just writing, it's music, it's acting, it's everything. Um, but it, it's like the, the a thousand no's and maybe one yes. Yeah. That, that tends to be the business. So what was one of the things that they said? Um, on my very first rejection with that very first novel, I, I still remember it because I just found it not too long ago. <laughs> it's faded, but I could still read it. And it said, 
it, it was a personal letter, which you don't get very often these days, but it said, even after reading, this is the reader of the slush pile for this, for writer's house, which is one of the premier agencies. Cause of course I was ambitious. Um, they said, even after reading the 23 page synopsis, never write a 23 page synopsis. So first of all, that was bad. Um, we're still not sure what this novel is about. The characters are two dimensional. The plot lacks tension, which is true. It, it did. Um, but it is strangely reminiscent of Clan of the, the Cave Bear, which is one of my other favorite novels of all time. So what I took away from that rejection letter was my book was like Clan of the Cave Bear. And so I decided I would keep doing this. Um, I, I racked up a lot of rejections since then. I've had people um, say they didn't like my main characters, that they were rooting for his demise and all this other stuff. <laughs> and, you know, wow. I think... And, you know, that all hurts. But at the same time, you you learn along the way and and you learn, too, that it's not always about you. A lot of times it's just timing, you know. Uh, I think that's true. Um, mm -hmm. I had Steve Alton on the show not too long ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you know who he is? I don't. He, he wrote uh, he's written a lot of novels, but he wrote the screenplay for the movie Meg, the one about oh, the giant shark? Yes, the Meg, yes. Yeah, okay. absolutely, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he said that there was a point when he was writing, and this was during the Jurassic Park craze, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. every book that he wrote that didn't have a dinosaur in it got rejected. Oh, no. You know, because that was the, the flavor of the week, was they wanted sure. something with dinosaurs. And yep, so, and it's been vampires, yeah. and it's been it's zombies, been, <laughs> and it's been, uh, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. So your mm -hmm. new book is called A Single Light? Oh, A Single Light, and it is the sequel to The Line Between. So those two go together. They are a duology, and they are a pandemic story. A pandemic story. Okay, can you give us a, not a 23-page synopsis, but <laughs> maybe a... A one-minute synopsis? Of How's course, that? yeah. The line between is where it starts, and it's the story of a young woman named Winter Roth. She's 22 years old, and at the beginning of the book, she is just leaving the doomsday cult. She's getting kicked out of the doomsday cult in Iowa that she grew up in for the last 15 years of her life, and so she's having to start over in an outside world that she's been taught to regard as evil. And right around this time, uh, uh, an epidemic has started up in the American uh, Pacific Northwest. And as it comes across the nation and barrels into a full-fledged pandemic, um, she it looks a lot like the apocalypse that she's always been taught was coming. And so it's the story of winter. It's a survival story. Um, and it is a story about a world on the brink of chaos. So we're pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say it's been a surreal last year because these came out and that well the second one came out just four months before we first heard of coronavirus anything about it in Wuhan. So you you'd actually written this before it hit, yeah? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. it was fortuitous, wasn't it? <laughs> it's a little surreal, I have to say. Yeah. So sometimes things like that can sort of uh, I don't know they freak me out. When I <laughs> see something or think of something and then it happens, you know, yeah. but there are, are those people in this world who claim that that is just one of the untapped powers of the human mind, mm. that we all have the ability to, to be greater at that, mm -hmm. but we just don't know how yet. But that's a topic for another show. <laughs> uh, we do have to wrap this up, unfortunately. Do you have a website that you want to give out? Absolutely. It's Tosca Lee. So it's T-O-S-C-A-L-E-E.com. And everything's on there, including the fact that I hit a code in the line between. And so if readers think they've found it, they can go to my website and there's a menu item called code and you can put it in there and see if you got it right. Oh, okay. Thanks so much for coming on the show. It was nice meeting you. Nice talking to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much.